We're going to pray, and then uh, after I pray, we'll seek God's blessing upon us. Uh, then we'll hear from God's word. Uh, so let's, um, let's all join together in a time of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we thank you that we can pause in prayer. We thank you that you are with us even now, this very hour. We have this confidence that your word is truth and that you have chosen through your son to reveal yourself and to speak to us through him. And so we pray that God the Holy Spirit would glorify God the Son, which we know this is the will of you, God the Father, so that your people will be built up and equipped for the work of the gospel and that we might be encouraged in the faith. To this end, bless the preaching of your word, for we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there was a, a, a really well-known, uh, famous sermon that was uh, preached by the Reverend Shadrach Lockbridge back in 1976, where he attempts to describe Jesus in, in this sermon. A sermon goes for about an hour, but the last three minutes, uh, he just has all these rhetorical devices and phrases which are used to try to describe Jesus. And I'll give you some of that. Here, some of the beginning at least. He says, the Bible describes my God, he says, as my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings, the Lord of lords. That's my king. Do you know him? And he goes on to say that he's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast, he's immortally graceful, he's imperially powerful, he's impartially merciful. He's the only one who's able to supply all of our needs simultaneously. He supplies strength for the weak, he's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathises and he saves, he guards and he guides and he heals the sick. He cleanses the lepers, he forgives the sinners. He discharges the debtors, he delivers the captives, he defends the feeble, he blesses the young, he serves the unfortunate, he regards the aged, he rewards the diligent, he beautifies the meek. I wonder, do you know him? And then finally, he brings it to this sort of climactic end and he says, oh, I wish I could describe him to you. I wish I could describe God. I wish I could describe to you an invisible God, the invisible God. And fail the weight of that, because that's a hard thing to do. How do you describe God? And here yet, in our text, Paul's going to do exactly that. And Paul describes Jesus as the visible image of the invisible God. He's just going to let that sink in. Look at verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. You even get your mind around, how is Jesus the visible image of an invisible God? It's a paradox. It's, it's almost a, a contradiction. Uh, it just means a proposition that is seemingly absurd. You know, like when somebody says, I'm nobody, but then they actually say, well, actually, I'm a compulsive liar. Well, which is it? They, they are a seemingly absurd statements or contradictions. A bit like, you know, when your mum used to say to you, not to go near the water until you know how to swim. Well, how do I learn how to swim? And so here is Paul, and he's saying, here is Jesus, and Jesus is a visible image of an invisible God. And at first, when you, you read that, it seems absurd. It's like a, a contradiction. It's like saying, Jesus is the something of the nothing. How can Jesus be a visible image of an invisible God? Or to put it another way, how could the invisible God have a visible image? 
And that's the question the Apostle answers in our text today. I just want to camp there for a little while. Let's try and work this out together to encourage each other in the faith. See, when you think of the image of God, what I want you to do is I want, to think, I want you to think of God's image as his attributes, as they take on a visible form. So God's inward being, that is his essence, is revealed to us by the totality of his attributes. Now, when we think of God's attributes, what tends to come to mind are things like omnipotence, uh, omniscience, uh, omnipresence. That is, we think of God and his attributes, we think oh, that he's all-knowing, he's all-powerful, and he's always present. And that's true. That's what normally comes to mind. But he's also immutable. That is, he never changes. So he's always good, always holy, always merciful. He, he's always sovereign. Bible describes him as infinite and eternal and unified. That is, he is self-existing, he is uncreated, and he's one. He's described in other ways. He's wise, faithful, good, just, merciful, gracious, loving, holy. And, and, and as you think about all the various attributes of God as described to us in Scripture then if you take the sum total of all those attributes, what they do is they reveal his essence. They reveal the invisible God. And here's the thing. When these certain attributes are expressed, what we tend to call them is we call them virtues. Or at least the communicable parts of them, the stuff that, that, that are transferable to humans where we can be like God, we can be just and kind and, and patient and loving and holy. Those things which we can be like him, when they're expressed, they become what we call virtues. It's why Peter says in our reading from 1 Peter 2.9, he says that you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, you're a holy nation, a people for his own possessions. Why? Why are you these things? And he tells you in the text that you may proclaim the excellencies, the word there means virtues, that you may proclaim the virtues of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. That word excellency, that the, 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 the church's role is to proclaim the excellencies of God, of Christ in this world, is actually the word virtues. Our calling is to be like Jesus and live in a way that proclaim the virtues of God. That we live in a way that proclaim how God lives, that, that are godly in comparison to the world. To, in a sense, proclaim his divine attributes in the way that we live and the choices that we make. Your lives are supposed to, in a sense, proclaim the virtues of wisdom and faithfulness and goodness and mercy and grace and, and love, hope and holiness. And because virtues are simply, in a sense, attributes expressed. And so Paul's saying that Jesus, and the, the Greek word there that says image is an icon, means icon that Jesus is this visible icon, this visible image of the invisible God. Indeed, since we read a little bit further on there in Colossians, it says that he, the fullness of God is in Christ. The fullness of God. Christ is the visible expression of the attributes of God. Whereas we proclaim some of the attributes some of the time. Christ is the visible expression of all of the attributes of God all of the time because in him is the fullness of God. And so when Christ walks the earth, he expresses God's attributes in his virtuous life. This is why Jesus said to Philip, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen the invisible God. It's also why in John 1.14 we read, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glories, the sum 
total of all of the attributes of God, the glory of God. We've seen it. When did we see it? Where did we see it? In Jesus. That's what he says in the text. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Because Christ, Jesus, is the full revelation of God. He is the visible image of an invisible God. And even if you wrap him up in carpenter's clothes, you can still behold his glory. His power to still the winds and calm the seas and heal the sick. His virtues of wisdom and faithfulness and goodness and ju- uh, justice and mercy and grace. His, his love and his holiness. Because even if you wrap up Jesus in carpenter's clothes, you can still behold the glory of God. Now, compare that to humans and our glory. Compare that to the Queen. See, if you, if you take Queen Elizabeth and you were to take away her palace and her crown, if you take away her, her robes and her gowns, if you returned all of her pearls and her diamonds, the glory of the monarchy just disappears. And behold, you see a grandmother. She would look no more glorious than my own mother because she has no intrinsic glory the only glory any king or queen has is that which bestowed upon her or him but you take away those thrones and crowns and robes and that glory just disappears but not so with Jesus because he is the visible image of an invisible God And he has intrinsic glory as the hidden attributes of God are actually revealed in him. Even if you do wrap him up in carpenter's clothes, you can still behold the glory. That's what Paul had in mind in Philippians 2.6 when he wrote, He was in the form of God. And in Colossians 2.9 when he says, For in him the whole fullness of the deity dwells bodily, because he is indeed a visible image of an invisible God, and therefore he's the firstborn over all creation. That's what verse 15 says, that he's the firstborn over all creation. And what it means by firstborn is that he's he's preeminent. It's about his status or his dignity. It's a reference to the fact that he is over and above all of creation. He's the firstborn over that. In a similar way that you might say that Donald Trump is the commander-in-chief of the armed forces. That is, he is over all the armed forces. And that's true of Jesus. Uh, The JWs say that because it has a reference here to Jesus the firstborn, they say, ah, that proves that that he's not God, but he's created. And, And in a sense, there is a little bit of ambiguity around that phrase, but how we should read it is not that he's the firstborn, he's created, but he's firstborn over it. And it speaks to the rights of being the heir like a firstborn and the, the preeminence of a firstborn and the dignity of being the firstborn. But then we don't even have to guess at this. Because if you look at the verses that follow, the verses that follow unpack what it means to be the firstborn over all creation. Look at verse 16. It begins with the word for. It's an explanation. It's a guard clause. So verse 16 says, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And then in verse 17 he says, And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. That is, Jesus' preeminence over all creation is because he is the creator and the sustainer of all things. He's not a created part himself, but he is the creator. It says that all things were made by him and all things were made for him. Indeed, everything holds together in him. The fullness of deity dwells within him because he's the visible image of an invisible God because he is the firstborn over all creation. In other words, it's speaking to his transcendence. That is, he's not part of creation. He's not constrained by it. He's not constrained by matter or energy or space or time because he created all those things. Therefore, he stands outside of them. And his nature and his power are not shaped by physical laws that he creates. 
And so Paul says that Christ not only created, but he actually sustains all things. The infinite creates the finite, the eternal makes the mortal. The immaterial fashions all things material and in fact immaterial so that the unknowable can become knowable and the incomprehensible might become comprehensible and understandable. You see, not only are all things made by him and for him, which speaks to our purpose as creators, beings, but also that everything is held together in him, all things. Now, creation is not like a clock that sort of gets wound up and then just gets to, be, to sort of run on its own. We call that deism. And deism is a belief that, that God made all the world, but he never interrupts it, never interferes with it supernaturally. But he's designed the world to, to sort of run on immutable laws that, that can't be messed with. Some of the great American presidents were deists. Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson were all well-known deists this idea that somehow God just creates everything and then he just leaves it to run. You know, set a bunch of laws like, like a software program to run on the hardware. And Paul rejects that idea. Because God is not distant. He's not an unattached creator who, who barely notices let alone cares for his creation. Paul wants us to know that through Jesus, God in fact is active in his creation. He created all things, but he continues to sustain all things. And that's why if you're watching me preach right now, this very hour, you can be confident that gravity will not suddenly disappear and evaporate like the mist and then all of a sudden I'll start floating away. You are confident I'll remain where I am right now for the remainder of this sermon because you know Christ is on his throne and gravity will do what it continues to do because all things hold together in him. Not just the creator, but the sustainer. That's why when you're head will hit the pillow tonight. You can go to sleep knowing full well that the earth's rotation will sort of not get bumped a bit closer to the sun so that we all wake up burnt like sausages on a barbecue. Why? Because according to Hebrews 1.3, Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. That's your God. And I wonder, do you know him? Your God, creator and sustainer of all things, all things made by him, made for him, and all things hold together in him. And if that is true, and it is true, what, what, what should you do with this? As the stock market crashes and burns, as the economy keeps shedding jobs and as the plague spreads and as isolation bites, sort of tempting to think that we feel abandoned, sort of forgotten or forsaken, that God doesn't care or he's not in control or maybe he doesn't see. You know, maybe you don't even have to tune into a sermon or you don't have to, to do all the things that you normally do because everything's not operating the way it is. No, no, no. Paul's telling us in the text, God isn't distant. He's near. And he's near us. And he's upholding us. He is this loving, powerful, knowing, ever-present creator and sustainer and that all things, including a virus, including you and your family, all things hold together in him. And if you were to let that sink in, if you were just to uh, meditate, this isn't a sermon for something to do, this is something for you to believe, for something you to meditate on. But if you were to let those truths that all things were made by him and for him and hold together in him, if you just let that sink in, then this world, our country, our finances, our family, our health, our homes, our businesses, our bank accounts, even our jobs, 
all things hold together in him. Now you would do well to ponder that in the days ahead. Because what it should do is should calm your fears. It should inform your thinking. It should empower your prayers. That the one who made you, the one who sustains you, the one who loves you, that all things hold together in him. It's a bit like when bird is around, all things administrative hold together in him. And that puts me personally at ease because Bert's administrative powers are legendary. Of course, when he's away, now thank God that because of the plague, he's not going anywhere in the near future. His little sort of wandering trips up the coast, they're going to come to an end for the next six months or so. But when he does go away, and you know, and I'm left to work with Richard or Tim or Matt, and they're now doing administration. You know what I'm saying? You know where this is going, right? Just fills me with fear. Of insecurity. Well, just as well that confidence as, as all things hold together administratively in birth and the result of that is it brings me this comfort and this peace that I know I can just leave it to him. I can just hand it to him and not worry about it. How much more is that true of your life in these circumstances, in our day, in our culture, in this plague? How much more is that true that here is Jesus and all things hold together in him to put your mind at ease so you're not filled with anxieties and concerns and worries? That the one who who put all the great galaxies in space and the planets that were formed and sustained by his word our planet and all the people upon it, our lives and every small minute, every small detail of it, every square inch, every single bean, every single soul held together in Christ. And if that is true, and it is, it should calm your fears, it should inform your thinking, it should empower your prayers. Amen? Then let's pray. Our gracious King, oh, how we thank you for scriptures and how we thank you that they have revealed your Son and your Son reveals you. We thank you that in Christ is the fullness of deity. We thank you that he is a visible image of the invisible God, but that he reveals your attributes in his virtues, that we see it in his power to calm the storms and to heal the sick, but we also see it in the way that he walks and lives, his justice, his mercy, his kindness, his patience, his love, even his wrath, his holiness. And it fills us with calm and confidence that the one who creates all things is the one who sustains all things. For everything was made by him and for him and is held together in him. And you love us. And you care for us. And you know the details of our lives the minutia of our days, the things that make us anxious. And so, Father God, how we pray that you would minister grace even now, that as we meditate upon these truths, it indeed would calm our fears, it would strengthen our faith, it would empower our prayers, that we could have this confidence, if, if you are for us, then who can be against us? And so we pray in the days ahead that it will shape our conduct. It will encourage us in prayer. It will cause us, our Father, uh, not to be fearful, but rather to have a confidence in you. 
Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we would take this opportunity to pray for others at this time. We want to pray for our nation and ask our great God that you would bless our leaders with wisdom and unity as they navigate these difficult days. We realise, particularly for premiers and our prime minister, that these days are exhausting, where sleep is a luxury and where the burdens of responsibilities would be weighing heavy upon those people. Father, we commend them to you and we pray that you would refresh and sustain them in the days ahead. Give wisdom for their decision making. Surround them with men and women who are capable and who are wise. Uh, put Christians in their path who will be able to uh, be a blessing and encouragement to them and to bear witness to you. And we pray if it is your will that you will lead us like the good shepherd uh, through these valleys of plagues. And our Father, we pray that as your church in particular, that there might be a certain boldness and a winsomeness in, a, in the way that we conduct ourselves. To that end, we want to pray for your people wherever they're gathering, that you would bless them too, that you would bless the vir virtual uh, communities that are joining together in congregations throughout our nation. Uh, bless those who are preparing service and particularly want to pray for those who are looking after technology and all the challenges that presents. We thank you for them and for their understanding and various gifts and we pray that you would harness them to be a real blessing to your church during this time. We want to take the opportunity to pray for those who are isolated and lonely, particularly the elderly or those who are living on their own. We would pray for encouragement and blessing for them. We pray that Christians in particular would, would be working hard to uh, make contact by phone to encourage people in those situations. Help us to meet the needs in practical ways and whether that is uh, visiting with food or particular needs, whether it's supplying um, phone calls and conversations. We pray that, that there will be a real desire uh, in the life of your church to take this opportunity as an hour to proclaim your virtues in this dark world so that we might be known uh, for uh, our grace and our love and concern during this time. Give to us generosity with uh, those things that you've given us and we're particularly mindful that things are in short supply and so we would pray uh, for the provision um, of uh, all essentials for our supermarkets and elsewhere and we pray that uh, as we move forward that things will ease on the demand side of things. Our Father, we want to pray for our many missionaries and uh, we're getting a feel for what it is like for them, that sense of isolation from people and the challenges that brings in the Christian life. And so we want to pray for our many missionaries here and overseas and they too will be getting caught up in uh, this uh, plague, or this virus as it spreads. And we just pray for safety and we pray for boldness and we pray that there will be opportunities for them to proclaim your excellencies wherever they are. We want to uh, commend to you, our Father, our own congregation and our presbytery and the various congregations that meet in the presbytery of Geelong. Pray that you'll bless them at the Ballerine and Geelong West and um, Bannockburn here as well as the Lee. And we ask that you would bless and encourage each of those communities as they meet. We pray for uh, those people who are going through difficulties uh, with finances uh, and employment. We are mindful that many people's finances are under stress at this time. And so we just commend them to you. We pray for ourselves that, that you will help us uh, to remain faithful during a testing time, that our prayers, that our service, that our worship, that our giving, that might continue. And so our Heavenly Father, Lord, we would commend all these things to you and we would uh, ask them all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. In his blessed name we pray. Amen.